camera. Yeah. To discuss the formulation of a new Water Resources Development Act or WARDA for 2022. Last month, the committee received testimony from the Biden administration on its priorities for the Army Corps of Engineers. Today, we will hear from state, local, and tribal officials and other interested stakeholders. Next month, we will hold a member day hearing to listen to our congressional colleagues on their priorities for this critical and bipartisan legislation. <clears throat> Let me begin by asking unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Let me be, I ask also unanimous consent that members of the full committee, not on the subcommittee, be permitted to sit with the subcommittee today's hearing and ask questions. And without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphones muted unless speaking. And should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I will request that particular member please mute their microphone. And finally, to insert document into the record, please have your staff email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. Today, the subcommittee will receive testimony from an array of state, local, and tribal leaders, as well as other stakeholders on their priorities for the upcoming word of legislation. Most of our witnesses here today have years of experience in working with the court to address the unique local water resources needs of the states, their communities, their tribal lands, and your input is invaluable to Congress as it develops a new water bill. We will also hear about potential improvements on how the core formulates and constructs critical water resources development projects, especially as they relate to partnerships with tribal nations. This committee on a very healthy bipartisan basis has not completed work on four consecutive water since 2014. And I am hopeful and confident that this tradition will continue in partnership with my good friend, the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Rouser. This committee is most successful because all of our members trust and recognize how critical the core work is to meet the unique water resources needs in our communities and how important regular predictable authorization of water is to meet these needs. However, as I noticed on last word of hearing in January, all of the projects and studies authorized in waters need appropriated funds for communities to realize the full navigation, flood control, water supply, and environmental benefits that these projects provide. Fortunately, under the leadership of President Biden, Congress responded by enacting the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which provides $17.1 billion to the Corps to carry out critical construction, operation, and maintenance activities in every corner of the United States. How critical is this historic funding? Well, the Chief of Engineers testified that it provides a once in a generation window of opportunity to deliver water resources, infrastructure programs, and projects that will positively impact the lives of communities across this great nation. Let me repeat a once in a generation opportunity to fund the projects and the studies that we authorize through our regular word of bills. For example, the bipartisan infrastructure bill known as BIL funds the initial elements of the Los Angeles River Ecosystem Restoration Project, a critical project to the future of my constituents and the whole Los Angeles region. The BIL also provides close to 1.1 billion to restore Florida's Everglades ecosystem, historic funding levels that would greatly advance efforts, as well as funding for the Brandon Road Aquatic Nuisance Species Barrier Protecting the Great Lakes. The BIL also makes critical investments in coastal and inland navigation projects, ranging from the Sioux Locks in Michigan to the TJ O'Brien Lock and Dam Project in Illinois to the Kennedy Lock and Dam in Kentucky, to the Norfolk Harbor Project in Virginia. It is, as well, provides essential investments to local flood projects, proje protection projects, ranging from the Seward, Alaska, to Winslow, Arizona, to Southwest Coastal Louisiana, to the city of Norfolk, Virginia. And what is the common thread between all these projects? 
all received their authorizations through recent word of legislation, but can and now finally will proceed to construction because of the enactment of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Last month, the Biden administration presented its priorities for the inclusion in new water. And today we give our stakeholders a chance to give their perspectives on the projects and policies that should be included. I am particularly honored to, we will also hear from two respected tribal chairmen and learn their experiences in working in, with the Corps over the generations. We have all heard lingering concerns about how federal government has failed its treaty obligations with Native Americans and their tribal heritage lands. In this regard, the Corps has had what some tribal leaders call a spotty relationship with the tribes. To address these concerns, Congress included language in WERDA 2022 require the Corps to promote meaningful involvement and consultation uh, with the Native tribes as well as other environmental justice communities. In addition, with confirmation of Assistant Secretary Army for Civil Works, Mike Connor, an old friend, and the appointment of his principal deputy, Jamie Pinkham, the Biden administration has chosen to incorporate tribal voices directly into the decision-making core. Between these two actions, it is my hope to form and bring a new culture of cooperation between the core and the Native Americans in the formulation of water resource projects and other core regulatory actions. I want to welcome all our witnesses here this morning and I am very grateful for your willingness to share your views and perspectives on what we should consider as we aim to complete the enactment of five bipartisan orders in a row on a bipartisan manner. And I yield to my great partner and in the formulation of new order, Mr. Rouser for any comments or thoughts he might have on this matter. And Mr. Rouser, I understand happy birthday, well wishes, or in order, sir. Congratulations. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> well, thank you. It's in about a week, but uh, we're going to stretch it out for a while. How about that? Um, again, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, you holding this hearing, and I would also like to thank our witnesses uh, for testifying today. Um, this hearing marks the second uh, hearing, as the chairman said, of the House uh, Representatives portion of the drafting of a Water Resources Development Act for 2022. And as I mentioned at our first, first water hearing, this is one of the most important pieces of legislation that we do uh, here on the committee. The more people hear about what is happening in Washington or not happening in Washington, the more they think it's broken and, and simply doesn't work here. Uh, but this has been a real exception and a real bright spot for Congress. Uh, every two years since 2014, we passed a water bill. In addition to being on a consistent schedule, uh, these bills have been bipartisan, and we're going to make sure that that continues. Exemplifying this, in 2020, the House was able to pass a WARDA by voice vote. And I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle here on the committee in the full House to pass another WARDA in this two-year cycle and for it to be a strong uh, bipartisan bill as well. Throughout this process, we will hear from people uh, from all over the country representing a wide uh, range of interest. And we're seeing a uh, sample of those uh, here at this hearing today. We'll hear, hear from folks uh, partnering with the Army Corps of Engineers on a variety of pro programs, ranging from storm surge prote protection to navigation at ports to environmental infrastructure. And I also look forward to hearing about these projects and how they can help their communities and our country. Again, I would like to thank our witnesses uh, for being here today. And Madam Chair, I have a, a little uh, housekeeping matter to take care of here, if you don't mind. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a November 29, 2021 stakeholder letter regarding the Columbia Snake River system. Our objection so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Rouser. It's a pleasure having you as my co-chair. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member I mean, uh, Chair of the full committee, Mr. DeFossi, for any thoughts he may have. Come on. There we go, finally. Um, <laughs> thank you, Grace, uh, and Madam Chair, excuse me. Uh, That's all, and, and again, all that want. <laughs> thank, uh, thanks again. A happy week uh, after your birthday uh, to Rouser. Um, you know, the, um, 
this is, uh, as has been stated, uh, an area of common common ground, something which is becoming uh, you know, more and more difficult to find these days, but I, I'm pleased that we are in fully engaged uh, in this endeavor, which is the uh, biennial reauthorization of the Water Resources uh, Development Act. Uh, as was noted uh, in earlier testimony, we actually passed it out of the house uh, by a, a voice vote. Uh, we had a, a good negotiation uh, with the Senate uh, but then, uh, unfortunately, um, the Senate <laughs> could not bring it to the floor, uh, even though it you know, was non-controversial. So uh, it finally ended up being part of the year-end uh, budget uh, omnibus uh, appropriation. So uh, we'll, hopefully we, we can move through in more regular order this time uh, with uh, maybe even a real conference. I'd really like to try and reestablish that tradition. I was hoping to do that on surface transportation uh, and, um, and get yet another uh, bill done uh, on a timely basis. Uh, in 2020, we authorized 46 chiefs uh, reports. Uh, you know, that's uh, projects ready for construction. Uh, and, uh, you know, we all know, uh, and we've already had quite a few submissions from members uh, about how important uh, the core is uh, to many members all across the country uh, for various aspects of, of the work uh, the core does. Uh, one of the most uh, difficult problems has been the backlog that the core has. They have been chronically, massively underfunded. Uh, and there are two things uh, that uh, are helping with that this year. Last year, we finally, after a a uh, 25-year effort, which I began with uh, Chairman Bud Schuster, not Bill, uh, you know, created uh, a Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund to spend down the $10 billion balance in the Treasury for needed work. Uh, that takes some pressure off the core and also is going to help, uh, you know, harbors uh, around the country with dredging, jetties, and, and other essential work. Uh, but also, uh, the core is getting a record allocation in the um, Investment Infrastructure uh, Jobs Act uh, of you know seventeen billion dollars, which will help them begin to move forward on many uh, critical projects across the country, and I fully expect that we will be adding to that list this year, and um, and then the core will have to uh, work through prioritization of of the many meritorious projects that are still awaiting construction. So uh, with that, I look forward to, to discussion uh, from our witnesses and moving forward with this bill um, you know, in the not too distant future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, thank you, Mr. Fascio. Thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. Uh, but I uh, would now ask unanimous consent that the following documents be part of today's hearing record. A letter dated February 7th, 2022 from the National Park Conservation Association a statement from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and lastly, a statement from the American Rivers. And without objection, so ordered. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, input, and we will now proceed to hear from our witnesses who will testify. I will ask the witnesses to please turn their cameras on and keep them on for, mid for the duration of the panel. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, we welcome the Honorable Wade Crowfoot, Secretary of California's Natural Resources Agency. The Honorable Peter Yucupicio, Chairman Pascua, Yaki Tribe, Arizona. The Honorable Daryl G. Secchi, Senior, Chairman Red, Band, Red, Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians, Minnesota, excuse me. The Honorable Michael Bechtel, Mayor of Morgan's Point, Texas, and President of Gulf Coast Protection District. Mr. Mario Cordero, Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach, California. Mr. Jim Middaw, Executive Director of Multnomah. Did I say that right, sir? County Drainage District, Portland, Oregon. And Ms. Julie Hill Gabriel, Vice President for Water Conservation, National Audubon Society, Washington, DC. And without objection, your prepared statements will be entered into the record and all witnesses are asked to limit the remarks to five minutes. And I will start with Mr. Crowfoot. You may proceed, sir. Well, thank you so much. Greetings from California. 
Chairwoman Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to join you today, and thank you for your stewardship of the critical investments we'll talk about. As the California Natural Resources Secretary in the administration of Governor Gavin Newsom, I helped to oversee efforts to prepare and respond to water challenges, which increasingly means what we call weather whiplash of drought and flood. We believe that California's water challenges, worsening droughts, dangerous wildfires that impact our watersheds, and intense winter flooding are a microcosm of challenges across the American West. Now, water, water infrastructure is obviously central to prosperity in California and the West, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers plays a key role. We are aligned with the Corps to help communities improve their resilience to this weather whiplash, to build capacity and partnerships with local communities, to enable environmental justice in underserved and rural communities, and to align both natural and engineering processes to deliver multiple benefits. We're very grateful of the 2020 WERDA and, the, and how it helped put Californians to work with its big investments in the Port of Long, Los Angeles and Long Beach, which you'll be hearing more about. We also appreciate WERDA 2020 funding to improve long-term water reliability across our region. That's our focus, too, in state government. Our state's policy blueprint on water, which we call the Water Resilience Portfolio, supports local coalitions doing the work it takes to address locally specific threats of more intense droughts and floods. In recent years, our state government has made historic water investments, including committing over $5 billion in last year's budget. But we know this is just a down payment. The need is truly vast. On the flood front, we hope WERDA that you developed this year continues the core commitment to protecting our Central Valley in California from flood risk. California made early investments in flood risk reduction projects in the Central Valley and generated excess credits in the process. Our investments were made in good faith on congressionally authorized projects in a transparent and cooperative way with the Corps. If the WIN Act language in WERDA 22 is not updated to eliminate the 2024 deadline and clarify how and when non-federal sponsor credits are transferred, California risks stranding over $200 million of investment. Specifically, our state is depending on these excess credits to provide a portion of non-federal cost share on key flood safety projects that we have underway now. Updates to the WIN Act will ensure that the federal government and the core can continue to meet their commitments to reduce flood risk in the Central Valley. Now in WERDA 2022, we are also uh, asking Congress to support and prioritize what we call nature-based solutions through the Corps' Engineering with Nature initiative. We've worked with the Corps on this approach to integrate nature into infrastructure, including uh, to expand seasonal floodplains in many of our watersheds, which both improves flood protection while also sustaining agriculture and restoring habitat, improving uh, water quality, and increasing opportunities for recreation. We feel strongly that the next word should advan advance this multi-benefit work. As you know, dredging waterways to protect nav navigation is a major core responsibility. And we are making the case that it needs to fund beneficial use of dredged, uncontaminated sediment. Historically, the vast majority of dredged material uh, gets dumped, uh, really, in, on our case, in the ocean. And at a time when sea level rise is threatening beaches, wetlands, ports, we need the core to fund beneficial use of that sediment. That use of sediment and projects to include coastal, increase coastal resilience to restore wetlands uh, needs to be accelerated. And we're excited to do what we call cut the green tape, deliver projects more quickly and cost effectively through shared permit processes, uh, utilizing joint, joint consultations, and shortening permit review timelines. Now, new forecasting technologies and what we call FIRO forecast informed reservoir operations has great potential to improve utilization of reservoirs across the West and country. And we are excited that the Corps is advancing this work and want to continue to partner uh, with the Corps and advocate for funding to update the Army Corps' flood rules for reservoirs like Oroville and New Bullard Bar. Finally, we hope that 2022 WERDA continues to fund and support the Corps at the Salton Sea in the southern part of our state at Imperial Valley. 
we've committed in state government major funding to the core, uh, I should say, to the Salton Sea. And the core, which is the lead federal agency to restore and stabilize the sea, um, requires the funding and priority to continue to do that work in partnership with us. I look forward to working with this committee and, and its members on the priorities. And once again, Chairwoman Napolitano, Chairman DeFazio, and Ranking Member Rouser, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Crowfoot. That was well put, and I agree with you both on the salt and sea and the dredging uh, material. Uh, next, I would like to recognize President Representative Stanton to introduce the next witness. Mr. Stanton, you recognize. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am pleased to welcome to our subcommittee Peter Yucupicio, Chairman of the Pasco Yaqui Tribe in Arizona. For more than 20 years, Chairman Yucupicio has served the Pasco Yaqui Tribe at first as treasurer, vice chairman, and now four terms as chairman. He also serves on the Pima Association of Governments Regional Transportation Authority and is the 2022 chair of the RTA board. Chairman Yucopicio understands the importance of managing and protecting the tribe's very limited water resources. Thanks to his vision and leadership, the tribe was the first recipient of federal funds under Arizona's Environmental Infrastructure Authority. In addition, he has been very active in pushing back against efforts to weaken the protections under the Clean Water Act. Chairman Yucopicio is also an accomplished musician and was recently inducted into the, into the Tejano Roots Hall of Fame. Thank you for wow. joining us, Chairman. We look forward to your testimony. Mr. Yucopicio, you are recognized. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, buenos dias. Good morning, Leo Centeno. On behalf of all our our tribal members, on behalf of all the members that are up in the Sewaania, which is in heaven, a blessing from all our people on our reservation and throughout Southern Arizona and the United States. Uh, Chairman, uh, Chair Napolitano, and Ranking Member Rousey, and the members of so the subcommittee, my name is Peter Icopicio, and I am the chairman of the Pasco Yaqui Tribe. I'm here today to testify on the Water Resources Development Act of 2022 and to urge the committee to increase the authorization levels for the environmental infrastructure authorities to help address the critical need for water infrastructure projects in Arizona and across Indian country. I would like to acknowledge and express my appreciation for the opportunity to testify today. The Pascoyaki tribe is federally recognized tribe with, with a reservation Southwest of Tucson, Arizona. We are a historic tribe with a small reservation established for the use of the tribe's 22,000 members. Since our tribal federal recognition in 1978, our government has focused on providing housing, public services, economic opportunities for our tribal members. Like many tribes, our tribe has limited access to potable water. In fact, our reservation doesn't have access to surface water and our access to groundwater is extremely limited. Instead, we get water service from our neighbor, the city of Tucson. But the total amount we can receive is capped and less to less than a thousand acre feet of water per year, per year. And we are on a pace to exceed our water delivery limits with the city of Tucson in only a few years. That is why the EI program is so critical since it provides another resource for communities, including tribal communities to meet our water needs. With the support of Congressman Greg Stanton and the Pasco Yaqui tribe was the first tribe in Arizona to tap into Arizona's EI authority. With funding awarded to the tribe through Army Corps, we are finally able to construct a water distribution line that will bring non-potable water to our tribal wellness center to irrigate our ball fields and a public park that we maintain to encourage the healthy lifestyle for our tribal members. By building out the distribution line, we will save about 16 million gallons of potable water, which can we use to supply water for 375 homes on our reservation. That means a lot to our small tribe. As I work with tribal leaders here in the West, 
I see firsthand a need for additional federal investment in water infrastructure on tribal lands. Unfortunately, many tribes lack the financial resources needed to access their water infrastructure needs. And while our tribe is grateful to have been able to tap into resources made available through the Arizona EI Authority, we also are aware that only a small handful of tribes across the country have applied or received assistance under this program. The Army Corps has been an excellent partner to the Pasquiaki tribe as we work to develop our non potable water line for the Wellness Center and our reservation, but the tribe was lucky to hear about the availability of funds for the EI program in the first place. Since the program is not formally noticed to Indian tribes, more should be done to assist tribes under the EI program. For example, the Army Corps could develop a tribal engagement plan to help bridge the gap for tribes that, to participate in this benefit of EI resources. A tribal engagement plan could ensure tribes receive notice of fundings about the program well in advance of any deadlines. The Corps could also offer individual tribal consultations for tribes interested in learning more about the EI program. We also recommend that the committee consider allowing tribes to use available federal funding sources to meet the 25% cost of share requirements of the EI program or eliminate this cost share requirement for tribes entirely. Finally, we hope the committee will consider the opportunity of the Word of Presents to expand the mission of the Army Corps to allow it to provide much greater assistance in water supplies projects moving forward. Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rousey, Rouser and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would be honored to answer any questions you have. And I also have here members of our council, which is Secretary Valencia, Councilwoman Buenamea, and then members of our staff, the attorney generals. And we are happy to answer any questions. But living here on the reservation, we actually live on bedrock, all the surface water, is sheep flooding and runs off this reservation so it, we can't hold it. And there's laws that protect that and, and the black wash that limit us from even uh, capturing any rainfall, any water. So that's that's Thank our you. status here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yucopicio for your comments and the points are well taken. I now recognize uh, Representative Babin for, to introduce our next witness. Mr. Babin, you recognize. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. And I am elated to welcome my very close friend, the Honorable Michelle Bechtel, to today's TNI Water Subcommittee hearing. Uh, I've known Mayor Bechtel for just shy of a decade, and in that time, I've met few others as dedicated or as knowledgeable as he is when it comes to the protection and the promotion of Southeast Texas and our many essential ports and the valuable energy infrastructure that we have along our Texas coast. As president of the Gulf Coast Protection District, Mayor Bechtel provides a unique and informative perspective for ongoing projects in the Gulf region. I'm very pleased to be able to publicly thank him uh, for the work and the study that he has put in to benefit uh, my constituents in the, in the 36th District of Southeast Texas and the greater Houston area and the local relations with the Army Corps of Engineers. I really appreciate Mayor Bechtel. In addition to his work with the Gulf Coast Protection District, Michelle serves as the mayor of Morgan's Point in my district as well. He has been one of the most positively influential community servants in Texas, and I can think of no one more qualified and knowledgeable to be sitting here today. I can also vouch for his marksmanship and his ability to take a duck down in any blind. Welcome, and we look forward to your testimony, Mayor. And with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Mayor Bechtel, you may proceed. You're being recognized, sir. Uh, thank you for your kind words, Congressman and uh, Chairman Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, Chairman DeFazio, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today to discuss stakeholder priorities for the proposed Water Resources Development Act. 
My name is Michelle Bechtel. I'm the mayor of the city of Morgan's Point, Texas, and president of the Gulf Coast Protection District. In 2021, the Texas legislature created the Gulf Coast Protection District to serve as a non-federal sponsor of the storm surge protection system described in the U.S. Army Corps Engineers Coastal Texas Study. The chief's report was signed on September 16, 2021. The district's five county territory, Chambers, Galveston, Harris, Jefferson, and Orange, is home to over five and a half million uh, residents, eight ports, and nine congressional districts. The district will also be the non-federal sponsor of the Sabine to Galveston projects located in the territory. Sabine to Galveston was fully funded in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 and has already begun construction in some locations. The Coastal Texas study presents a plan that will protect the upper Texas coast against hurricane storm surge from the Gulf of Mexico. The proposed components include a gate system, a nature-based uh, beach and dune system, ring barriers, gates and pump station systems on the mainland coast. The multiple lines of defense provide a delicately balanced approach to protecting the central human and economic infrastructure that contributes significantly to the nation's economy while preserving the beaches and unique ecosystems in the Texas Gulf, Gulf Coast. This project is not only important to the safety of the Upper Texas uh, Coast residents, but provides vital protections for the economy of the states you represent and the whole nation. During 2021, we witnessed the fragility of supply chains that resulted in monumental economic disruptions. Understanding supply chain perspectives when major hurricane disasters hit the Upper Texas Coast is important for recognizing the considerable national benefits of a Texas Coastal Storm Surge Protection Plan. Following major weather events, supply chains are affected by storm damage to structural and human infrastructure. Reduced, reduced worker capacity impedes recovery work at facilities, exaggerating uh, supply chain disruptions. Truck driver shortage is a key component of this human infrastructure intensify following storms. Trucks move the supply chain for the top 10 commodities, including electronics, grocery and convenience store goods, hardware, gravel, grains, and gasoline. Agriculture is uh, impacted by supply chain supporting fertilizer, seed, crop protection products, and machinery parts. In 2020, the U.S. exported over $1.2 trillion in manufactured goods. The Houston port region is home to the largest petrochemical complex and export port in the United States, providing $802 billion in national economic value. If back-to-back -back hurricanes hit the Houston ship channel, similar to Louisiana in 2020, critical economic activity in the port could be shut down for an extended period. This means no port activity, no cargo, no commerce, no jobs. Staggeringly, 96% of all manufactured goods are directly touched by the business of chemistry. Texas is the largest chemistry producing state in the nation. The business of converting these basic uh, chemicals into textiles, food packaging, automotive parts and safety glass, home furnishings, construction and roofing materials, Paints and coatings, pharmaceuticals, and fertilizers occurs in other states, many of which are represented on this subcommittee. If left unprotected, major storms impacting petrochemical and port infrastructure would significantly disrupt manufacturing, retails, and business operations supply chains in states across the nation. If the region's chemical producers can't produce ingredients, manufacturers can't generate products. Truckers and air freight can't move inventories. Retailers can't stock shelves. Exports are halted. In addition, 80% of the nation's military-grade fuel is supplied by this region, a national security issue for you to consider. The deep and significant impact of protecting this region from catastrophic storm surge is evident. The security of state and national economies will be hugely improved with the implementation of the coastal Texas projects. In closing, I will leave you with how the Coastal Texas Project could affect your jurisdictions. Import and export commodities moving through the Houston Port region are connected to manufacturing and retail supply chains in each of your home states. Each of your states have commodities that import through the Port of Houston. 
Thank you again for this opportunity as you deliberate the stakeholder per priorities presented to you. I urge you to consider authorization of the Coastal Texas study. The projects presented, uh, represented in Coastal Texas offer not only a comprehensive storm surge reduction plan, but a plan of undeniable return on investment. The Gulf Coast Protection District is ready to begin a long-term long -term partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to carry out this once in a lifetime and landscape changing project. Again, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Uh, Chairman Seki, you may proceed. <clears throat> Ani, distinguished members of the subcommittee. So we're now basically in the Shining Council, which is why we're going to call on. We say, do we? We do washing, Mamish Kazanikan, and Pujiba. Can you go churn in and move them? Major Ganun and Nago go to the Shitaman and the Pimina Mina, where we keep going on. My name is Daryl G. Siki, Sr. I'm the chairman of the Red Lake Band of Chipoyanians, and I will speak on behalf of the Tribal Council and our membership. Jimmy, which to you and the other distinguished subcommittee members for the opportunity to dis testify on the experiences of Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians working with the Army Corps of Engineers. The Red Lake Indian Reservation is composed of more than 840,000 acres in northern Minnesota. Nearly 29% of the Red Lake Reservation is covered by water, that is 240,000 acres. Army Corps projects have drastically changed our environment, preventing fish passage and damaged 25,000 acres of the Saudi Marsh, which was one of the last remaining extensive tracts of pristine marsh in the North Central States. Beginning with the passage of the Flood Control Act of 1944, the Corps replaced the stub log structure at the outlet of the Lower Red Lake with a new liftgate dam. Constructed a low head block dam several miles downstream from the outlet and dredged and Channelized significant portions of Red Lake and Clearwater Rivers. After these projects were complete, significant driving of the marsh was observed, drying of the marsh was observed, along with the disappearance of water flow and fur bearing populations that the, that the band has relied upon for generations for food, culture, and, and economic purposes. Fish passage restrictions also became a huge problem. In 1957, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a report on the environment damages resulting from the flood control project, but subsequent efforts by the Army Corps to restore our environment failed. The Red Lake knows our experience with the Army Corps is not unique. It is prevalent throughout Indian country. The band supports the other tribes' efforts for red redress concerning for Dakota Access Pipeline, Enbridge Line 5 and Enbridge Line 3. Last year, we were party to a lawsuit against the Army Corps to request a preliminary injunction to stop construction of Enbridge Line 3. While Red Lake cannot say our relationship with Army Corps has been cordial at all times, there are three particular moments in Red Lake's history where the band's relationship with the Army Corps has made headway. One, restoration of the walleye population. Two, construction of the first passage in 2011. Three, current efforts to rehabilitate marshlands surrounding the dam. I have discussed these all truly in my written testimony. But today, I want to focus on our joint efforts to address the first passage and the rehabilitation of the Saudi Marsh. We are currently conducting a feasibility study funded by the Corps before we begin a two-phase restoration. Phase one will address the fish migration barrier constructed by Army Corps in 1958. Phase two will focus on restoring the marsh. This will allow for necessary seasonal flooding of this wetland and help with downstream flooding issues because wetlands are very effective at holding water during high water periods. As the subcommittee prepares for the Water Resource Development Act of 2022, we urge you to include three critical provisions. First, appropriate 950,000 construction funds to support phase one of Red Lakes Fish Migration and Zoggy Marsh Rehabilitation Project. Second, appropriate 100,000 for the Army Corps to enter into agreement with Red Lake to conduct 
biological surveys before and after phase one is complete to show the impact and effectiveness of the core's investment. Currently, Red Lake is home to one of the largest concentrations of native freshwater mussels in the state of Minnesota. It is an area of special concern. Three, Congress should direct the Army Corps to hire a tribal liaison for each district to increase government to government consultation to ensure the tribal concerns are addressed in a timely manner. I want to say to me, Grace, for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to work with your subcommittee to guide the court into a new direction. Again, to be great. Thank you, Chairman Seki. Uh, your comments are well taken, and I would not like to recognize Representative Lowenthal to introduce our next witness. Mr. Lowenthal, you mm -hmm. recognize. Thank you, Chairwoman Napolitano. I'm honored to introduce Mr. Mario Cordero. Mario is the executive director of the Port of Long Beach, which is located in my district and has held this position since 2017. I've been privileged to call Mario a friend and a partner for almost, or maybe even more than 40 years, uh, we've been working together. Mario, in, during his illustrious career, has served as the distinguished chair of the Federal Maritime Commission under President Obama, and he now serves as chair of the American Association of Port Authorities. He's worked tirelessly to make the Port of Long Beach a clean, efficient, and dynamic fixture in our community. You know, recently the nation has seen uh, the supply chain vulnerabilities and the stacking of ships we watched every night on TV outside of the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. I am proud to say that under Mario's leadership, the Port of Long Beach introduced policies that not only reduce this con congestion, uh, but also put into effect long-term uh, policies that will in the future increase the efficiencies of the port. So this will not happen again. Uh, there are a few people more qualified to speak on port issues, and I look forward to his full testimony. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Cordero, you may proceed. You're muted, sir. You're muted. Chairman Napasio and Chairwoman Napolitano, Ranking Member Graves, Ranking Member Roser. It is an honor and a privilege to testify before the distinguished subcommittee today to discuss the Port of Long Beach Deep Draft Navigation Project. My name is Mario Cordero. I'm an executive director of the Port of Long Beach. Before I discuss this project, I would first like to commend <clears throat> the subcommittee for holding this hearing. Passing the Water Resource Development Act, or WERDA, as it's commonly referred to, on a biannual basis has provided the country's navigation community with the reliability and certainty that it needs to advance critical navigation projects like the one at the Pearl Long Beach. The Pearl Long Beach stands in strong support of developing the Water Resource Development Act of 2022 and would like to acknowledge the tremendous bicameral <clears throat> and bipartisan track record of this important infrastructure bill. Thank you for your leadership and commitment to this authorizing process. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge Congressman Lowenthal, a longtime member of this committee and an ardent champion of the Pearl Long Beach. Congressman Lowenthal, I cannot recall a time that this committee has held a WERDA hearing and you haven't mentioned the Pearl Long Beach. Thank you for keeping WERDA needs front and center. Chairwoman Napolitano, it was around this time in 2020 that you led a congressional delegation to visit Southern California that culminated in a visit to the Pearl Long Beach. You and many of your colleagues present day had the opportunity firsthand to have a sheer magnitude of the operations at the Port of Long Beach. The Port of Long Beach is one of the few U.S. ports that can welcome today's larger vessels serving 175 shipping lines with connections to 217 seaports around the world. And together with the Port of Los Angeles, we move more than 40% of the nation's waterborne goods. We are quite literally the epicenter where the box meets the docks. I appreciate the opportunity today to highlight the significance of the port's deep draft navigation project and the value that the navigation mission of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers provides to the nation. I take a moment in front and say that 
but for the shared goal and collaboration provided by the core of Los Angeles District Office and the South Pacific Division, we would not have signed the Chief's report ready for construction authorization in WERDA 2022. <clears throat> this project has been years in the making and is a central component of the port's master plan. Given the pandemic and due supply chain challenges that this country faces, which is the port is working on lockstep with the administration's White House Supply Chain Disruption Task Force to address, not a day goes by where supply chain issues are not a story in the nightly news. And while this deepening project will improve the efficiency of waterborne cargo, it was actually envisioned well before COVID-19 pandemic exposed the vulnerabilities of the national supply chain. The Port of Long Beach has long focused on making every aspect of operations more resilient. Deepening the port is a key component of the big picture. As the world's shipping fleet has produced larger ships, the existing channel deaths and wisps do not meet the draft requirements of these fleet vessels that call on the port. The deepening project will improve conditions for current and future container and liquid boat vessel operations in regard to safety, reliability, and waterborne transportation efficiencies. This project will result in immediate and quantifiable national and local benefits, including reducing air emissions and improving vessel maneuvering. The chief report shows that this investment is a highly variable ben benefit cost ratio 3.5 to one. Improving navigational efficiencies reduces emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases. Reduction in harmful air emissions will benefit disadvantaged and diverse communities surrounding the Port of Long Beach and reduce the climate impacts of port operations. When our project with the US Army Corps of Engineers is conducted, these ships will call at maximum capacity under the most all weather and tide conditions without waiting offshore. In my role as chairman of the board of directors of the American Association of Port Authorities, I recognize the importance of the Corps in maintaining and improving our nation's navigation assets. The Port of Long Beach, much like ports around the great, uh, in our great country, rely on the expertise and experience of the Corps to ensure that our ports remain open and our economy remains strong. I wanna thank this committee for prioritizing the needs of the Harvard Maintenance Trust Fund in World 2020, having a schedule to distribute the estimated 9.3 billion in unspent HMT tax collections will go a long ways towards restoring trust in the trust fund. I look forward to working with the committee through your oversight role to ensure that the intent of Congress is reflected in the court's development of a master plan to distribute the HMT funds. In closing, we are thrilled to have reached the chief report's milestone to be eligible for construction authorization. The Port of Long Beach respectfully requests this committee to support for including the project in the word of 2022. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. And I, of course, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Cordero, very much for your comments. I'd like to recognize now Chairman DeFacio to introduce our next witness. Mr. Chairman, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the next witness, um, Jim Nidoff. Um, has uh, an, an extraordinary resume of, of work, uh, both uh, at the city level, state level, regional level, uh, um, environmental issues and, uh, and uh, other uh, major issues of concern. In this case, um, he is bringing together a comprehensive approach uh, for the metropolitan region of Portland uh, with the Multnomah County Drainage District and Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District. Uh, it's an extraordinarily uh, important uh, organization. Uh, the threats, uh, you know, are extraordinary. Portland Airport among the many uh, in terms of uh, the levees and, and, and uh, we'll hear more in his testimony. Uh, he also is uh, very distinguished in having worked as my first pre press secretary many years ago. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeFacio. The very fine comments. Mr. Middall, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair DeFacio. Best job I ever had, I have to say, except for maybe this one. This one's really good, too. Uh, but Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Napolitano, Ranking Members Graves and Rouser, and members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today and for your efforts to keep our infrastructure in good shape. As the chair said, my name is Jim Middaw, and I'm the executive director of four special districts that serve as the non-federal sponsor of the 27-mile federally authorized Portland Metro levy system. 
Well, there are four districts responsible for Portland area levies. We do operate as a single system with a unified staff. We're currently, as the chair mentioned, consolidating into a single new district to ensure we efficiently and effectively meet our local obligations. But before I get to our project, I really wanna take a moment to highlight the Corps' important role in our region, from flood protection to energy generation, to recreation, to dredging, to navigation. The Corps connects the Pacific Northwest to the world's markets and is an important part of our community. And the Oregon and the Northwest would certainly be less safe and less vibrant without the Corps. Which brings me to our project. Our system in Portland was built in the 1930s to protect the region from the Columbia River, which is, if you don't know, is the fourth largest in the nation by volume. The Columbia drains parts of Canada, Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. It's an area roughly the size of Texas. And the Portland region sits near the bottom of that basin. Simply put, the Portland region is the largest urban area in the Columbia River watershed, and our levees were built over eight decades ago to protect what was then farmland that has long since transformed into a dense urban landscape of businesses, homes, and critical infrastructure. We're part of the core rehabilitation and inspection program, and we work really hard to fulfill our local maintenance obligations. But like Lieutenant General Spellman, who testified before you recently said, Due to changing conditions and increased risks, to keep people safe, the Corps needs partners, and so do we. Fortunately, following a series of major hurricanes, Congress wisely passed a storm-related supplemental appropriations bill during 2018, and the Portland Metro levy system was among 39 projects that received federal funds designed to help prevent future disasters. Because we'd done a lot of work locally before the Corps study was authorized, the recommended plan was completed ahead of schedule and under budget. The plan provides a roadmap for critically needed investments to protect underserved communities and improve the resilience of our system in the face of increased river flows and extreme rain events that are happening across the globe. In short, with your partnership and support, our project will fulfill congressional direction to help prevent major disasters. The project's important because there's an at-risk community of 42,000 people behind our levees and the protected floodplain sustains more than 59,000 jobs and $16 billion in annual economic activity. Many of these jobs are in manufacturing and other industries that provide on-the-job training, living wages, benefits, and a chance for advancement for people without college degrees. The levies also protect two airports, including the award-winning Portland International, three interstate highways, multiple transit and rail lines, regional electricity transmission facilities, backup drinking water wells for a significant part of Oregon's population, a new US Postal Service Processing Center and a US Air National Guard base. There's also more than 2000 acres of parks and natural areas that provide habitat for multiple species and close in access to nature for underserved people. But just as important, the Corps did a great job planning actions that avoid critical habitat, which is why federal natural resource agencies found the project would have no significant environmental impacts. One of the most complex and important actions in the plan is replacing an old railroad embankment that's currently used as a key part of our system. It's the same embankment that breached in May 1948, led to the destruction of the city of Vanport and displacement of more than 18,000 people. Our own work and the core study document the ongoing risk of increasingly frequent rain on snow events in the Northwest and unprecedented rainfall events and the severe impacts they will create without more investment in our system. Fortunately, our recommended plan will improve life safety behind the levees by 70% and significantly reduce the chance of flooding for decades. And while I have a chance to talk with you today, I also want to express our support for ongoing improvements in how the core projects are evaluated. We stand with our colleagues at the National Association of Flood and Stormwater Management Agencies and believing the BCR process should reflect the significant benefits of avoiding development and maintaining habitat and recreation in areas that are at significant risk of flooding. Congress and the Corps made significant investments in Greater Portland's flood safety infrastructure 80 years ago. Those investments helped our region become the great place it is today. Now, the livelihoods of people throughout the Northwest rely on the levee system's continued protection. As local sponsors, we're ready to pay our share and do our part to move this project forward. Therefore, it is my honor on behalf of everyone in Oregon, and in fact, the entire Northwest, to ask you to authorize the Portland Metro Levy System Project in the 2022 Water Resources Development Act. Thank you again for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Middaw, for your, for your comments. And we now turn to Ms. Gabriel Hill. You may proceed. 
Chair Napolitano, Ranking Member Rouser, Chairman DeFazio, and members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you here today. I'm Julie Hill Gabriel, the Vice President for Water Conservation and serving as the Interim Vice President for Coastal Conservation at the National Audubon Society. Audubon's mission is to protect birds in the places they need for today and tomorrow. But for birds, just like people, water is life. And that is why water conservation is a key focus of Audubon's work. And because advancing principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging is a strategic imperative for Audubon, we're focused on ensuring that the conservation programs we support complement the needs of underserved communities and support the need for additional tribal partnerships like those highlighted by my fellow panelists today. We also recognize that climate change presents the single biggest challenge and threat to birds. Accelerating efforts to increase climate resilience must take center stage in the next Water Resources Development Act through things like increasing the use of natural infrastructure and nature-based solutions while prioritizing investments in the Army Corps' aquatic ecosystem restoration mission. This committee's leadership around the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will help advance critical climate resilience through an unparalleled investment for ecosystem restoration like those in the Great Lakes and the Everglades. Now the Everglades has garnered some of the most longstanding nonpartisan support among all conservation issues, especially in the state of Florida. Restoration efforts are essential for addressing recurrent toxic algae blooms, seagrass die-offs and red tide that have plagued the state's coast for far too long. The IIJA, alongside increases in annual federal appropriations, can serve as a catalyst for constructing many restoration projects that the subcommittee has authorized, going as far back as 2007. But while more Everglades projects come across the finish line, we must concurrently focus on the work that lies ahead, like construction of the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir, the single most important project to provide benefits throughout the ecosystem. But big, bold projects like the EAA Reservoir require budget flexibility. And budgeting tools like the use of incremental funding or a continuing contracts clause can efficiently advance projects through annual appropriations rather than awarding piecemeal year-by-year -year contracts based on the partial funding that's available. Another place where bold action is needed is along the nation's largest watershed in the Mississippi River. Restoration of the river and its delta along coastal Louisiana is a top priority for Audubon, where we've owned and managed over 26,000 acres for almost a century. Audubon supports efforts in WERDA to help address the ecological crisis in this region, including a confirmation that the Lower Mississippi River Comprehensive Study was intended to be fully funded by the federal government. And Army Corps efforts can benefit from complementary initiatives like the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Act that is also before the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. In addition to advancing critical ecosystem restoration projects, provisions and passwords present important opportunities to incorporate the use of more resilient natural infrastructure to reduce the impacts of storms, flooding or coastal erosion, and promote reliable water supply. These can include nature-based options like restoring wetlands, oyster reefs, and coastal forests, and they can be used in place of or alongside traditional infrastructure like seawalls, jetties, or levees. But despite clear statutory language and recent word of bills directing the Corps to advance the use of natural infrastructure, many measures are not yet being implemented. Some efforts like an update to the principles, requirements, and guidelines have been delayed and nature-based solutions are not being implemented uniformly across mission areas or districts. So one option to support these approaches is to create a resilience directorate who can provide specific focus on facilitating the use of natural infrastructure across all areas in the core. Finally, it was heartening to hear Assistant Secretary Connor's comments in January about the potential for the Army Corps to play a greater role in addressing the unprecedented drought, wildfire, and water scarcity challenges in the West. Whether it's through a whole of government approach or better understanding the part the Corps can play in advancing natural infrastructure options that address water scarcity, the Corps can and should be more engaged on those issues, like those around the Salton Sea that was also referenced by Secretary Crowfoot. 
Audis Bond stands ready to work with the Army Corps, the subcommittee, and other partners to find innovative and efficient ways to advance water infrastructure and help protect birds in the places they need. And at Audubon, we truly believe that where birds thrive, people prosper. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Now we'll move to our witnesses, uh, member of questions. Thank you to all our witnesses very much. And uh, we will start member of questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes. The votes will start, schedule start about an hour and a half. We need to move the committee to be finished by then, we hope. Mr. Facio, you will begin. You recognize. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks again to all the witnesses. Uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Middaw, um, you um, uh, talked about the, uh, the way the Corps is doing uh, CBRs now and the fact that they are in the process of, uh, you know, modernizing and updating uh, that process. Um, you know, with the principles, uh, uh, requirements, and guidelines, uh, how would that uh, benefit uh, projects like the one you're working on? Thank you, Chair DePazio. Well, just briefly, after the Vanport flood, the Portland region decided to set aside the area that had flooded for recreation and habitat purposes. And we were surprised in the process of working with the Corps that that provided almost no value in the BCR. And for us, that creates a, a really great opportunity to prevent future harm and to store flood water. So we'd love to see uh, projects like ours that recognize the value of protecting areas that frequently flood instead of only valuing those areas that are built out and at risk of flooding. So we think it would make for safer projects across the nation and help projects like ours advance in the process. No, that's an excellent point. And, and it's also an excellent point in terms of federal flood insurance and uh, having, uh, you know, we're struggling with uh, looking at chronically flooded areas and uh, how we're going to uh, deal with them and looking at ways to incentivize people to be to be bought out. Uh, in this case, uh, that whole area was reserved and that certainly is tremendously uh, beneficial uh, in terms of flood protection storage and uh, also uh, avoiding costs to the federal government. Uh, to uh, to Director Cordero, you 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 have uh, about seven specific uh, things uh, for your report. They're going to increase uh, efficiency. As you know, we all anyone who's ever landed, uh, you know, at uh, LA has seen the line of ships out to sea. I've seen it a number of times. Uh, what's your timeline on those projects? Uh, and uh, you know. How much will that uh, mitigate the uh, chokage we have? Well, thank you for your question, Mr. Chairman. As you referenced, our priority here at the Pearl Long Beach is to increase transportation efficiencies. And of course, in the era of COVID and the supply chain disruption that we're witnessing in every major container gateway, there are, needless to say, challenges. Now, with regard to the specificity here, uh, currently, uh, we have a number of vessels off the coast waiting in to get into the port complex, which consists of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So I think our timeline right now is we're working very hard with our stakeholders under leadership of the White House Port Envoy John Picardi, uh, which we meet two, three times a week to address the various issues that we need to uh, uh, address to mitigate capacity constraint at the terminals. So the good news is we're making a lot of progress with regard to long dwelled imported containers at the complex uh, and as to the vessels in terms of what we believe the timeline will be that we'll get to some sense of normalcy. I think there are opinions that anywhere from six months to the end of the year. But on the other hand, again, I think it's fair to say that um, all this we have to keep in mind is COVID based. Uh, it's a global supply chain issue, but the good news for the nation's largest container port complex is, complex is we've made some headway with regard to how we are addressing the complaints and making sure that again, the cargo moves and on this note, I want to also emphasize our thanks to the men and women who work on the docks. There's not been a day that this port has closed. And so these essential workers really have worked uh, uh, around the clock, so to speak, to make sure the nation's commerce moves through this very important gateway. No, we, we appreciate uh, the efforts of, of all those at the port uh, going to 24-7 uh, uh, to help try and mitigate. And of course, you're not the only choke point on the supply chain. Uh, you know, we have uh, tremendous inefficiencies at the uh, 
distribution centers to which a lot of these uh, goods are, are trucked. And, uh, and that has only gotten worse over time ever since uh, we abolished uh, their uh, obligation uh, to pay for detention time. Because uh, to them, it's like, well, I don't care if you sit there for six hours. <laughs> we don't want to put on another shift at night. So uh, we have to take a comprehensive approach. But I'm, I'm pleased you're making progress. And uh, that's, that's good news. So thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Russell, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Bechtel, um, question, uh, several questions actually I have for you. Um, as we all know, communities across the country are facing serious uh, supply, chain, supply chain challenges. And of course, this underscores the importance of transportation and port infrastructure uh, to the economy. Uh, what is the economic impact of the Houston port region and what threats does the region face uh, from coastal storms? Uh, and then follow up to that, how would the Coastal Texas Resiliency Improvement Plan uh, help mitigate those risks? Okay, the, uh, I, can, I can speak, the, the imports through the Port of Houston directly impact uh, on machinery, appliances, electronics, 11 states. Um, Hardware, construction materials, 12 states. Automotive, four states. Chemicals, minerals, resins, plastics, 14 states. Retail consumer goods, four to five states. Uh, steel and metals, six. Food and drink, uh, nine. Furniture, primarily two states, Florida and North Carolina. Um, we also, the, the district is home to Port Beaumont, which is the number one military port in the United States. Um, obvious, uh, a big part of the, the country is impacted by products that go through the Port of Houston. Uh, we need to protect the Port of Houston and the Houston Ship Channel area. There's no question about that. Um, did that answer your question? So talk a little bit about how the Coastal Texas Resiliency Improvement Plan helps to mitigate some of those risks. Well, what we want to do is we want to build across the, uh, the Houston Ship Channel at the uh, Bolivar Roads, which is between the city of uh, Galveston, Galveston Island and Bolivar Peninsula, uh, uh, ship gates across the Houston Ship Channel. The key component here is to prevent the pre-surge from coming into Galveston Bay. If we can do that, and we feel the gate system alone uh, could supply about 65% of the protection that we need, uh, that will go a long way to uh, preventing impact uh, up the, the Houston Ship Channel, which is home to 140 plus plants uh, petrochemical plants and refineries along the Houston Ship Channel. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the dunes and the, the uh, beach improvements along the coast itself would do a lot to protect the residential uh, areas along the uh, upper Texas coast. So the benefit would be uh, pretty wide ranging, basically, is what you're saying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the key features of the Coastal Texas Plan as it relates to the Bay defense systems. Well, what we're looking at, in addition to the gates across the uh, Bolivar Roads, which is about two and a half miles across, uh, the in-bay, uh, say the mainland uh, projects would include gates at uh, Clear Lake and Dickinson Bayou, uh, ring levee around the city of Galveston uh, to protect it from the floods from the backside. As the uh, Houston, or excuse me, Galveston has had protection from the Galveston seawall uh, for over 100 years now, since the 1900 storm. And the only flooding that uh, impacts the city of Galveston uh, from hurricanes is primarily from the north side, from the bay side. And uh, we need to limit the water from going into Galveston Bay for as the, the storm moves inland, 
the winds change and the water comes into the backside of the city of Galveston. So the ring levee project is going to be very important long range for the uh, uh, city of Galveston itself. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Cor uh, Mr. Cordero, uh, can you talk just very briefly about the Port of Long Beach uh, deep draft navigation project and how that will help uh, alleviate supply chain issues? I've got about 15 okay. seconds left. Yes, absolutely. So essentially, we're a containerized gateway, but we also are a gateway that receives one of the largest liquid bulk vessels. So basically, what that deep draft navigation study will do will improve transportation efficiencies, will improve safety and operations with regard to these large vessels that are coming into this port gateway. So uh, we look forward to, again, to continue to move forward to work with the Army Corps and create these transportation efficiencies and that also will reduce costs. Thank you, Madam Chair, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Rouser. I recognize myself for five minutes. Secretary Crowfoot, uh, thanks to your agency and, and other local waters uh, agencies in California, the Congress has been working with the Army Corps in recent years to more effectively operate core dams for local water supply without causing flood risk, flood control risk. Climate change has exacerbated extremes in our state. Like right now, we're going to 80. We've been in the 60s before. Extreme periods of storm and extreme drought uh, during the December, Folsom Dam was forced to release 100,000 acre feet when there was no forecast of additional storms. How has your agency adapted to the new reality of drought and better managing our dams to retain water storms? And how can the Corps do to improve operations in them by working with you and local agencies? Thanks for the question. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Here in Sacramento, our state capital, we had the longest period of time without any measurable rain, uh, almost a year. And the storm that broke that uh, record uh, provided the most rain we ever received in 24 hours, over five inches, demonstrating this weather whiplash. The short of it is we need to make better utilization of our dams and reservoirs to better control or protect uh, for flood safety and for water supply. The good news is, thanks to the Army Corps' leadership and partnerships with states, that uh, dam reservoir operations are being upgraded, like at Lake Mendocino. Uh, which is a federal dam that now uses forecast informed reservoir operation to more flexibly manage water supply. Again, both for flood safety and water supply. We need to do more of that across our state and federal dams and we need to do it more quickly. Uh, the, from our perspective, the climate change is accelerating. We, we know this and we're experiencing it in real time. So we really do appreciate the Corps leadership uh, in, in this effort and word of 2022, can provide critical funding to make this happen. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Cordero, it's great uh, that uh, uh, you uh, thank us for being uh, uh, with you on before Word of 2020, the subcommittee. You said you had a problem with ships waiting off, off the coast for birth space. Uh, was it due to the COVID uh, labor shortage or uh, truck shortage? We know we in Southern California have seen that for years. But how is this deepening project alleviate the problem of ships waiting on shore? Why is it beneficial from supply chain and environmental perspective? Well, first of all, thank you for your, uh, your question, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as you've referenced, there's been a disruption in the global supply chain. And again, there's not a port, a major port that has been immune from this disruption. So uh, as I've referenced, uh, this is all COVID based. And by that, I mean in spring of 2020, uh, when the world really came to a stop in terms of the impacts of that, uh, or negative impacts of the virus, uh, it provided some questions for us to really think about. And by that, I mean, I think the disruption here in the supply chain really accelerated or elevated the conversation how about how fragile the supply chain is here in the United States. One reason, and there are, little, there are a number of factors, but one reason, I guess the Secretary of Transportation, uh, Secretary Budishek, who visited our port here last month, put it best. Uh, disinvestment, the history of disinvestment in our ports and the move now to invest in our ports. So I think it's fair to say that the more we, as ports across America, invest in our ports, and as chairman of the APA, I will tell you that ports across the country are investing about $33 million a year. Thank you, Mr. Cordero. I think I, I have enough, not enough time, but I want to recognize Chairman Yukupicho and Teki 
and honor them uh, because they're part of a conversation to improve partnership between the core and the tribes in address, addressing historic needs. Uh, both of your valuable suggestions on improving partnerships with the core, including potential appointment of tribal liaison for core districts, as well as addressing the inability of many tribes to financially partner with the core. Uh, can you summarize key changes you'd recommend? Oh, Congresswoman, that is a great question. I don't we have, have 34 seconds, sir. I don't have those exact details at this moment, but I do. I'd be more than happy to circle back with your office following the hearing. Great. Jim Seki. And Mr. Yukopisho. Thank you. Uh, yes, a true partnership, and we look forward to working with the Army Corps. You know, we have always been at disadvantage here in the desert from bringing water and 55 gallon drums to the reservation way back in the 60s to now. We still struggle with our infrastructure and water needs and it'll continue, but we truly, truly want a great partnership with the Army Corps to figure these things out. And we ask the committee to do that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Your point's well taken, sir. Now we'll call on uh, Mr. DeFazio to for five minutes to for questions. Mr. Webster. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for putting on this hearing. Thank you and the ranking member. Uh, the second hearing about WARDA uh, is uh, it's good to be here. The, um, I have a question for uh, Ms. Julie Hill Gabriel about the uh, SERP in, uh, in the Everglades and the plan that it is and the, then the, uh, it's been there for over 20 years and then the EAA and what we, we got the money from, uh, getting the money from the bipartisan infrastructure plan, which is over a billion dollars. Uh, how do you see that money utilized in those two areas? Thank you, Congressman Webster. Um, so great to see you again and, uh, and having Same. wonderful memories of presenting you with Audubon's Champion of the Everglades Award in relation to some of the great progress you helped us accomplish in, in former WARDA um, bills, including authorizations of um, the Central Everglades project, which is part of what the Everglades agricultural area is, is a component of. Um, so I think overall, you know, when we talk about the fact that the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan was authorized in 2000, we're more than 20 years down the line now. Sometimes we have to remember all the different phases that it took us to get to where we are today. There was a lot of time spent in the planning effort of planning the different projects and then, you know, getting them authorized through this committee, getting them funded, then actually getting them under construction. And I think where we are today is actually seeing a number of projects cross the finish line. And when fully constructed, they're actually at the point of making sure that we're operating them to achieve the return on investment that we're promised. And I think one of the most important things that we've learned through that whole process is that you have to be moving forward on all of these fronts concurrently. If we do one project at a time, wait until it's finalized, you know, this is gonna take decades and decades more and the urgency is simply too clear to let things continue to take that long to progress. So the infrastructure funding, you know, will help advance a number of projects that either already were underway or other components, again, some of which were authorized back in 2007 um, to get those finished and across the finish line. But we absolutely have to maintain that focus on some of the, the projects that impact multiple parts of the ecosystem, like the Central Everglades Project and the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir, that's a part of that. We hear a lot about the impacts to, you know, the coastal estuaries, east and west on Florida's coasts, and all of the devastating impacts that they've seen. 
but the reservoir doesn't just benefit those areas. It really also sends that fresh water south, which is how uh, the system naturally worked to make sure that all parts of the ecosystem, including the Southern Everglades, Florida Bay, um, that they're also seeing restoration. So it's important to make progress on projects that are already underway, but equally important to continue moving forward, especially with things like that Central Everglades and uh, the reservoir project that will help so many parts of the system. Well, thank you so much and uh, good to see you again. Go back. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Uh, Ms. Johnson is next, followed by Mr. Bevin, and then Mr. Garamendi. Ms. Johnson, proceed, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and let me thank the full committee chair and the ranking member, Mr. Rouser, for holding this hearing. Uh, it has been um, most encouraging to work closely over the years with the Army Corps of Engineers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, my congressional district in the North Texas area have been affected by periodic flooding and related matters. Um, problems which have been and will continue to be exacerbated by climate change and erratic temperatures, which we have just experienced. The Army Corps has been a tremendous partner in those efforts uh, to address these issues, and I'm pleased to also that the Joe Poole Lake project received money in this uh, in our latest bill, which will go a long ways in helping uh, to avoid some of the sliding. I want to ask the question to uh, the first question to Mayor Beck Bechtel. Um, Mayor, as you made evident in your testimony, the Gulf Coast Protection District is of critical importance, not only to Texas, this coastal communities, but to the entire nation. And the International Inland Port of, Texas, of Dallas is a crucial connecting point for goods transported from the Gulf State, uh, Gulf Coast ports as they pass northbound and westbound by freight and truck. So in fact, the Union Pacific Dallas International in a modal terminal in, in my district provides a tremendous amount of intermodal access to the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach as well. Can you describe how the businesses at the Dallas Inland, Inland Port are adversely affected by the Gulf Coast storms you mentioned in your testimony? Certainly, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. The uh, the Port of Houston and the, oh, we have seven, seven other ports in the, uh, in the district also, but the, primarily the, the Port of Houston is the largest on the, uh, the Gulf Coast. Uh, the, seven ports. the, the uh, products coming through the Port of Houston go all over the, both the Southwest and Southeast United States and right up the, the, the core of the central. And uh, the, the logistics part of it onshore is to me the, the biggest bottleneck in, in current terms. Uh, if we have a shutdown of the port uh, down here on the coast, certainly the supply chain all the way up to Dallas and then from the distribution centers, uh, Dallas throughout the rest of the United States are gonna be severely hampered um, just on, on the goods coming through the port. Okay. Uh, now, Mr. Cordero, I am wondering what is the relationship between the Port of Long Beach and the Dallas Inland Port? And roughly how much business does your port do with the Dallas Inland Port? Uh, great question, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, basically, if I understand your, your question of relationship uh, there with the Dallas folks, uh, number one, I think uh, clearly uh, moving containers by rail is of utmost importance right now, and in fact, a priority for Port Long Beach. So through our partnership with the Class 1 Railroad, uh, the UP, and the BNSF, 
uh, that corridor that leads from California to Texas is vital. And so I think it's fair to say that uh, we uh, have a very good collaborative relationship with, with the railroads and the stakeholders in terms of moving the cargo here that comes from Asia inland. And as you may know, there's not a container that comes here at the Port of Long Beach that doesn't end up at uh, every uh, congressional district in the mainland. So needless to say that uh, for us, this is a very significant gateway and particularly our partnerships with uh, other uh, ports and other important regions in Texas, particularly is very vital for us and important. Thank you very much. Um, just a little bit more time. In my congressional district, I'm proud to report that the Audubon Dallas is quite active, founded in 1973 and primarily responsible for managing and maintaining a 600 acre cedar ridge preserve in uh, Southwest Dallas County. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the excellent work the Audubon Society is doing on restoration projects in Everglades, the Mississippi River, and in coastal Louisiana. In Texas, we have serious issues related to coastal flooding along the Gulf Coast near Houston and South Texas and along the Rio Grande Valley. We also have serious uh, inland flooding issues in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Can you speak to some of the work you're engaging in to address uh, yes. these issues in Texas and, and your work to restore and enhance the ecosystem? Ms. Johnson, Ms. Johnson, would it be possible for her to address them in writing? Time is up and we've got uh, uh, a lot more with, uh, witnesses uh, questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, I will. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Babin, you recognize. Yes, ma'am, thank you very much, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Rouser for convening this hearing. I wanna thank you, uh, all your witnesses for being with us today and a special welcome again to Mayor Bechtel. I'm looking forward to working on word of this year and I'm optimistic about our ability to work together to improve upon our nation's infrastructure. In Water 2020, we were successful in passing numerous provisions such as an inland waterway cost share adjustment, uh, flood risk management modifications in Orange County, kicking off a significant aspect of the Coastal Barrier Project and authorizing the expansion of the Port of Houston Ship Channel. As a matter of fact, we were not only successful in passing the authorization to dredge and widen the Houston Ship Channel, but we also got a project appropriated and secured as a new start designation all in one year's time but we're still not done. In word of 22, I will advocate for the Army Corps of Engineers to assume operation and maintenance of the entire Houston ship channel. In light of the Port of Houston Authority's recent economic review showing that locally preferred planned cost has decreased dramatically, I'm confident that the Army Corps' assumption of maintenance is economically justifiable. I represent four ports. In addition to the Port of Houston, my district is also home to the Sabine Natchez Waterway Channel, which hosts two Department of Defense contracted commercial military strategic seaports and serves more than 55% of America's strategic petroleum reserves. We are in the midst of a channel improvement project which will improve and optimize the waterway. But in order to continue moving this project along expeditiously, <clears throat> we need to get the Army Corps' favorable decision document recommendation back so that we can authorize construction of additional navigational features. Finally, I will be working alongside several of my colleagues here today to support the project authorization of the Coastal Texas Study. Thank you to Mayor Bechtel for all the work you have done on this project and for your leadership in Southeast Texas. As you have highlighted here this morning, the breadth and the extent of this project's implications are extraordinary. This will be one of the Army Corps' largest infrastructure endeavors, but will support and bolster millions of jobs and have an incredible economic impact on our country. Madam Chairwoman, I would like to enter in the record a letter of support from several different industry leaders and stakeholders expressing their support for this project, if you will. So ordered. Question one, Mayor Bechtel, can you tell us what money the district has available to meet its financial obligations? Well, initially the state of Texas uh, provided 50% of the funds uh, for the Texas Coastal Study with the Corps of Engineers, which was approximately $10 million at the time. 
Uh, since then, uh, the state in the 86 legislative session in 2019 uh, appropriated $200 million uh, primarily for local match funds for the projects in Orange and Jefferson County. Uh, and in 2021, with the legislation that set up the Gulf Coast Protection District, uh, the legislature uh, appropriated another $200 million uh, at that time. Uh, so $400 million uh, from the uh, state legislature in say direct funding. Okay. Uh, in, addition, in addition, the, the protection district was granted uh, tax and authority uh, with voter approval uh, in the uh, legislation that set us up. And uh, the board is also exploring uh, alternative funding uh, along the lines of resilience bonds or something else that we can do. Okay, and uh, question two, uh, still directed to you. Uh, some of the projects that make up the coastal barrier are already underway. For example, the Orange County is expected to sign its PPA with a core next month. Can you update us on the Sabine to Galveston projects and what the status is on those projects? Okay, the, the S2G, uh, which was uh, approved uh, in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, uh, impacted Orange and Jefferson County, which is part of our district now. The uh, Gulf Coast Protection District is uh, in negotiations currently with the Corps of Engineers uh, on a PPA uh, covering the Orange County projects. Jefferson County uh, Drainage District number seven uh, was the original uh, non-federal local sponsor uh, in their area. And they signed the PPA with the Corps of Engineers in 2019. Those projects are, uh, are in, in the Orange County project is in the, uh, just really kicking off in the uh, engineering design phase. Uh, in Jefferson County, the project, they're actually moving dirt. Uh, the third project, which was on the other uh, end of, of our district, uh, the Velasco uh, drainage district project, uh, they signed a PPA with the Corps in 2021. Mr. Bechtel, would you please uh, uh, give further information in writing, please? Time is up. Thank you. I will yield back. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Garamendi, you're next, followed by Mr. Grace, then Mr. Lowenthal, and Mr. Weber. Mr. Garamendi, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, thank you very much, all the witnesses. A very interesting, very useful discussion. I want to focus on California, so Mr. Crowfoot, uh, you're going to be up in a moment. Uh, I want to focus specifically on dredging and uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in 2016, the state of California sued the Corps of Engineers to stop hydraulic dredging, that's suction dredging, claiming that it would somehow hurt the long fin smelt, uh, thereby forcing the uh, Corps to use clamshell, which is two to three times more expensive. The result of that was that the uh, Corps of Engineers no longer now has dredging every other year and add up two to three times the cost. In 2019, the state sued the Corps for not doing enough dredging. So we got a problem here. And I really want you to focus on the use of hydraulic dredging and the opportunity to do real-time monitoring as to the extent of damage to the smelt. Are they really anywhere nearby and is the hydraulic dredging more or less contaminating the water than the suction dredging. Secondly, I want you to consider the beneficial use, which is a high state, a high priority for the state of California. The doubling, the tripling of costs makes the beneficial use that much more difficult. So we got an inconsistency here and I'd like you to focus on that. There's no doubt that we need to do more dredging in the Bay if we're gonna maintain the um, international shipping that's so important to the state of California. Uh, secondly, uh, in the Delta, 
the state of California set up various uh, restoration projects for the wetlands of the Delta, mostly using imported material. The state of California does not, is not a sponsor of the dredging for the Port of Stockton and for the uh, Sacramento River from uh, Carquinas uh, into the heart of the Delta. The result of which the dredging projects are dropped and the available material is not available for your restoration projects in the Delta. I'd like you to consider this. I'd like to have your comments on the inconsistency of the state uh, policies here that are actually preventing the goal that the state has observed. And do keep in mind this new green lining thing that you talked about. Yeah, well, thanks so much. First of all, I'm committed to unpacking these issues with you. I think we share a similar North Star, which is to ensure that enough dredging happens so that the ships and the boats can actually be involved in our economic activity that's so important. Obviously, while protecting the environment and building our resilience to sea level rise and then that inundation of saltwater into our Bay Delta. So I, I am confident that we can actually balance uh, each of these priorities. We do believe that the use of that beneficial sediment is really important to build our resilience. We recognize it's more expensive and we'll look forward to working with you and also Army Corps uh, leaders in the region to explore just what project makes sense uh, to use that beneficial uh, sediment. And then to your point around the state's litigation around the federal government, I'm committed to, again, moving beyond that and getting to a point where we can dredge our rivers and the Delta as we need to for our economic activities uh, in a way that is actually uh, you know, not harmful for the environment. So complicated issues, but you have my commitment for my own personal time and energy on it. Uh, very good. And do keep in mind the uh, lawsuits that are holding up the water uh, projects also. I do want to commend your agency for your work on the site's reservoir. Uh, moving that along, we now have to move the federal government on that, specifically the uh, Office of Management and Budget. Hopefully we'll get that one done. And finally, with regard to the restoration projects in the Sacramento Valley, uh, your commitment uh, and participation in the very extensive 300,000 acre plus restoration project that includes the rice fields and the bypasses, extremely important project, not only for flood protection, but also for environment and all of the various species. Uh, if you'd like to comment on that in the closing moments, uh, either sites or uh, the restoration projects, please do. 100% agree. And let me talk about the restoration projects. Remarkable partnerships between mm -hmm. agricultural leaders and rice growers and groups like Audubon to expand our seasonal floodplains. I'm really bullish on our ability to do that, not only to recover the salmon, uh, but to support agriculture. So, uh, you know, 100% committed to moving forward on that. And thanks for your words on Sites Reservoir as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thousands more questions. I'll be in your office shortly to get all these things resolved. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi, very much for your on-time uh, delivery. Uh, Mr. Lowenthal, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mast is next, followed by Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Katko is next. Behind. Mr. Mast, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman. I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Uh, Hill Gabriel, uh, I have... Uh, just a little bit of dialogue I'd like to have with you. It's good to see you. I uh, want to thank you for your advocacy, uh, the Audubon Society's work and, and everything that you all do on behalf of the Everglades. I do very much appreciate it. Um, this summer, uh, Audubon made, they, they're making statements constantly, but Audubon made a statement uh, about the threat of harmful algal blooms. Everybody knows I, I continue to work on this on the the WERDA, uh, the, the Water Resources uh, Development Act and um, subcommittee and full committee. It's uh, plaguing my community, as you well know. So the, the statement was made that uh, exposed fish die quickly uh, and consuminating, uh, rather consuming uh, contaminated fish or shellfish, it's dangerous uh, for birds and dolphins and, and other terrestrial mammals. Um, so I, I guess what I'm asking in, in talking about the statement that Autobad has made is, you know, are the birds, the canaries in the coal mine here? Thank you, Congressman Mast. And of course, as always, thank you for your, your passion for Everglades restoration and especially, you know, continuing to hold up the plight of uh, the communities along the St. Lucie estuary in particular. Thank you. Um, 
I think before getting to that, you know, I just always have to share, I feel like I was able to share with the subcommittee a few years ago, my own personal experience. It's hard to articulate and explain the, the experience of being around one of these toxic algae blooms. Um, in my own experience, you know, I lived in South Florida, but I did not live along that estuary and I was up there visiting and had really never experienced anything like it, that I was across the street from any body of water, like where I thought was pretty far away and opened the car door and having that rush to your senses immediately, you know, I, I mean, I thought I parked next to a dumpster was my real experience with the, with the odor, but really a feeling like your eyes are on fire. It truly is hard to articulate until you've experienced it. So just want to thank you again for, you know, trying to articulate um, what those experiences are for folks who've never, who've never uh, had that firsthand. And for me, it's truly only strengthened my resolve for focusing and being an advocate for Everglades restoration. And we know that absolutely toxic algae blooms, you know, have experience, have impact um, on the species that birds rely on for their food sources. Similar, we, similarly, we know that when there's excess, you know, nutrients and waterways, it changes the uh, it changes the vegetation that the birds rely on. And that's part of why, you know, we've been such advocates for trying to remove excess nutrients throughout the entire ecosystem, you know, starting in the Northern Everglades all the way down to being huge supporters over the years of the really, you know, monumental work that the state of Florida has done to clean nutrients out of the water before it reaches some of those places where, where birds are um, more prevalent and relying on that clean water source. Um, and I think that, you know, some of the progress that has been made has focused on that, but there's still a long way to go. And that is part of why we, you know, keep focusing on, you know, getting projects finished that are in the pipeline for Everglades restoration, while also looking to advance the ones that are still ahead, like finalizing that Central Everglades project and the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir that we know will help hold some of the water, have it go through those filtration marshes, and then continue its path south into the Southern Everglades and Florida Bay, because all of those different areas are different or uh, are important for different species of birds. And so it's water quality is absolutely prevalent and an important issue for birds, but it's also things like the balance of fresh water and salt water that can dramatically increase and uh, the challenges that birds have in finding a food source. And at Audubon, last thing I'll say is, you know, we've been lucky enough in a lot of places like in Florida Bay to actually study uh, the fish, the forage fish that birds rely on and how the bird populations um, have changed over the years for sometimes more than a hundred years. So we're able to see the impact of those changes as they happen and use that. And that really, you know, for us guides our positions and our advocacy in advancing Everglades restoration. All right. Would you, uh, you described that situation of opening up your door. Would you work in the middle of that for uh, 10 hours a day? I will say that I went home and as someone who had little children thought about, you know, the impact that of course we, we, we call, you know, we dub things the lost summer but truly thinking about the fact that I was able to go home, right? But others don't have, that is their home. And uh, that has stuck with me for a long time. Would I let my kids play outside? No, you know, would, would it be um, just such a hard experience to imagine folks who have to, who have to um, you know, endure those conditions at those times when, when those blooms are so active. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank, Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lowenthal, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Cordero, thank you once again for your kind words and for highlighting the, oh, I've lost, and for highlighting the importance of Long Beach's deep draft navigation project, uh, both for our community and, and for the nation's economy, the administry, uh, the inv this investment could not come at a more critical time as, as we work together with the administration and the private sector to strengthen our supply chains. Incidentally, I was glad to hear uh, Chair DeFazio recognize the importance of your leadership and the Port of Long Beach's leadership 
in moving towards 24 seven as a way of really dealing with the congestion. This project, the deep water, the deep draft navigation uh, project can make the port op also can make the port operations faster, more productive and even cleaner by making navigation more efficient. You have, you've already highlighted the excellent cost benefit ratio that the project will enjoy. And I'm determined to continue to support this critical investment. Uh, this year's word of bill through projects like this can make a real difference for the American people. And while continuing to advance climate resilience, nature-based solutions and environmental justice, critically important is the issue of environmental justice. Mr. Cordero, can you elaborate more on the national economic benefit of this project? And if you have time also on the environmental benefits of this project? Yes, absolutely, Congressman. As you may be aware, when the Army Corps first looked into this matter in collaboration with the Port of Long Beach, the overriding concerns were two. Number one, the National Economic Development Plan, and of course, how that fits in terms of the navigational improvements. So suffice to say that there's four areas here, or five in terms of draft uh, projects that need to be addressed. The West, the West Basin, the Approach Channel, the Main Channel, and Pier J South Slip and the Pier J approach. In essence, creating uh, more draft for the larger vessels in the world to visit here at the Port of Long Beach, uh, be it container and be it liquid bowl. So the importance in terms of the national impact on this, let me just end by saying in the, uh, in the proper context in one case of a liquid bulk vessel. The largest uh, tanker uh, to visit a North American port was in fact here at the Port of Long Beach. And now we're trying to address that approach here from 76 a foot draft to 80. How much of a difference does that make? Every one foot of draft that we could create in essence translates to anywhere from 35,000 to 40,000 barrels of product. Uh, and so that's a significant impact with regard to uh, that type of uh, commodity that comes in here. And of course, the dependency of the nation with regard to on the energy front, how important that is. So for a port of Long Beach, it's not just a question of container as cargo, there's also a diverse portfolio of liquid bulk cargo. Thank you. In the time I have remaining, uh, can you elaborate on the environmental benefits of this project, especially to the community surrounding the port complex? Absolutely. So what, what occurs that uh, in the case of bulk vessels, we have a process what's referred to as lightning. Uh, and what that basically means is when a tanker vessel comes in and it's too large to come into the harbor, we have a smaller vessel that goes out there and, and has the economy transferred to the smaller vessel, which goes into the harbor as a second uh, transfer. All this creates further emissions, idling, which again, is, will be unnecessary if we create the proper draft for the bigger vessels, which incidentally, the larger, new, bigger vessels are environmentally more friendly, not only in terms of the technology that they use, but the fuels that they use. So uh, I think it's a very positive step of eliminating emissions here at this harbor complex. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cordero. And uh, thank you for your uh, active support for the Long Beach Deep Draft Navigation Project. And I yield back. Thank you, thank you Mr. Lowenthal, very much. Uh, Mr. Graves, you're uh, recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank the witnesses for joining us today. Um, Ms. Uh, Hill Gabriel, Section 213 of, of the Water Resource Development Act of 2020 includes a study of the lower Mississippi River uh, system. And so that's everywhere from Cape Girard, Missouri, all the way down to the mouth of the Mississippi River. As you know, uh, Mississippi River and Tributaries Project, uh, of which that, that river is obviously part of, is 100% federal cost for virtually everything. Yet the Corps of Engineers interpretation has found that this is a study that's gonna require a 50-50 cost share and the non-federal sponsors would be seven different states. Um, do you believe, one, uh, that, that this project is important in reassessing the management of the lower Mississippi River system? And uh, two, do you believe that uh, that type of interpretation uh, that does seem inconsistent with MRT is the, is the right approach? Thank you so much, Ranking Member Graves. Um, 
first, I have to begin with the fact of reiterating just how important the study is and including just work in this area in general. Um, our own recent study with Audubon and partners have noted um, for our purposes and our mission that there are some birds where 50% of the North American population rely on the Mississippi River Delta for their breeding and habitat. So something that is just an absolute top priority for Audubon and of course affects, you know, the largest watershed in the nation. And I think that there, to have any impact and decision-making around the format that a study can take that has the potential to delay its implementation is really you know, not addressing the urgency and the need of the issues to move quickly. Clearly that you know, if a study needs seven non-federal sponsors to coordinate and come to the table and iron out differences and identify whose responsibility is whose before we advance things, that is gonna take longer. Um, and I think it's really imperative that we act with the utmost urgency to understand more about the, the river and the issues that are facing it so that we can start to get to the next step of undertaking more action to address you know, the challenges that are being faced there. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, until Texas come in, comes in and totally blows the, uh, the numbers out of the water uh, with their authorization this year of $28 billion, um, uh, Coastal Louisiana uh, has, I think, the largest groupings of authorizations for storm damage, uh, risk reduction, hurricane protection type projects, navigation, ecological restoration. And, and, and as you know, uh, Ms. Hill Gabriel, these, these projects all work as sort of a, in a system. And, and in Louisiana, unfortunately, the authorization is not weaved together sort of like an Everglades or a Great Lakes initiative that, that does uh, put everything into one program. But, but again, they're all, they're all related. Um, back in the Water Resources Development Act of 2007, Title VII had a, a cross-crediting provision. Um, and, um, and, and it allowed for you to develop credits on one project, move them over to another, and in order to sort of move this in more of a program type direction, uh, Congress came in and cleaned it up again in 2014 because of uh, flawed core interpretations, cleaned it up again in 2016 as we continue to play whack-a-mole with the Corps of Engineers. Um, have you seen uh, under any of the interpretations or the interpretive guidance coming out of the Corps of Engineers an actual functional system that, uh, that, that would allow for cross-crediting or allow for really functionality in, in implementing these projects? Thank you again, Congressman. And I think, you know, one thing just to, to put some emphasis on, um, of course, we always appreciate your leadership in highlighting these issues as it relates to coastal Louisiana. Um, you may have heard, I believe, Secretary Crowfoot mentioned a similar example in the Central Valley where they're having challenges of, you know, transferring uh, non-federal sponsored credits to, uh, across different projects. I will say that in the Everglades, while the overall program, the overall comprehensive plan was authorized as one piece, you know, there was a decision made that each individual component, each individual project still needs to be independently authorized. But what has been done there is the development of sort of a non-federal sponsor and federal, so uh, non-federal sponsor and Army Corps ledger where they balance out um, across the programs as a whole. And, and so that and the has task allowed force that helps with the integration as well. Exactly. And a state and federal task force to help guide some of that. And I think the lesson there is just, you know, we need to allow efficiency and creativity when there are options on the table. And if there, as you noted, many provisions in WERDA and discussions are already ongoing, that's something that, you know, should be reinforced and supported. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Uh, next order will be Mr. Carvajal, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Stanton, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Carvajal, do you recognize? Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the witnesses for your time and testimony today. You all know better than most how these projects affect our communities and the role they play in environmental and human health and economic development. California is home to several ports that see billions in economic productivity annually, including the busy port of Long Beach. The Water Resource Development Act we are currently working on and funds included in the bipartisan infrastructure law for the Army Corps offer a great opportunity 
to improve the efficiency and the resiliency of our ports. Mr. Cordero, around the time two years ago, around this time two years ago, I had the opportunity to tour the Port of Long Beach with the congressional delegation led by my colleague, Chairwoman Grace Napolitano. As you mentioned in your testimony, the Port of Long Beach supports 2.6 million jobs across the nation and is an important part of our supply chain infrastructure. In my role as chair of the Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation Subcommittee, I have heard a fair deal of stakeholders about supply chain issues. We've done quite a bit of work here in Congress to help alleviate that problem through investments included in the bipartisan infrastructure law. But I know there's always more work to be done. Can you discuss how a bill like WERDA can help further support port infrastructure? Yes, thank you, Congressman. Well, we mentioned one of the uh, major projects here with regard to the deep draft navigation study and making sure that our channels have enough draft or deep enough to uh, navigate or have the larger vessels navigate. We talk about the largest, the large vessels, but in terms of the width. So I think it's fair to say that with regard to some of these projects that we are, are addressing, uh, it goes a long way in making sure that uh, these larger vessels come in and with the uh, size of the vessels that we have today, uh, Congressman, 14, 16, 18. In fact, at the Port of Long Beach, we recently had a 20,000 TU vessel and last year, a 24,000 TU vessel. I think, again, the name of the game is how we continue to move containerized cargo here in terms of the throughput. And as Congressman Lowenthal and Chairman DeFascio said, that's why we have the concept of 24 seven uh, vision here in terms of pilot projects that we're operating right now. But to your question, I think again, what's important is to move cargo in a more efficient manner. And of course, environmentally more friendly. And on that last point, that's why we're focusing on rail investment here. But uh, I hope that answers your question in terms of the bigger picture of what we're trying to do here at the Port of Long Beach as the nation's most significant gateway. Thank you very much. Ms. Hill Gabriel, communities living near ports face unique challenges due to sustained exposure to pollutants and toxins as a result of port operations and ship emissions. As a county supervisor, I worked on the Blue Whales Blue Skies Initiative to reduce ships emissions. And in Congress, I introduced the Expanding Maritime Environmental and Technical Assistance Program, META Act, which was signed into law through the fiscal year 22 NDAA to support the reduction of air emissions from vessels by authorizing additional funds for the Maritime Environmental and Technical Assistance Program to fund research and activities related to zero emissions technology. What other recommendations do you have for us to tackle this problem and help reduce harmful emissions from port operations? Thank you so much, Congressman. And I appreciate all of your leadership on that issue and, and advancing. I do think you know, the focus on technical assistance is always an important place to start. And I think that the more we understand um, the new innovative approaches that can take shape when we incorporate, um, you know, especially local knowledge on exactly what's happening. You know, while there are overarching issues to address, every port issue that I've ever looked into is different, right? There are different impacts. There's different ecological factors at play. Um, and as you noted, different proximity of communities uh, to the issues. So I think continuing to further find that effort of coordination and whether it's, you know, formulating a, a different pathways for community, for community engagement um, in a regional level related to the port and finding that ways to garner some of the great ideas and understanding of the full impacts and then having the capability to raise that up um, to the Army Corps or other federal agencies that address these issues, I think is critical. Thank you very much. Uh, and I just, I must say that the Meta Act, I was um, lucky enough to be able to join my good colleague, uh, Representative Ellen Lowenthal, who took great leadership with that legislation. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Karavhan. Uh, 
Mr. Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit to Chairman uh, Siki and Chairman uh, Ucapicio. Uh, I, I just think it's fantastic. We've got two tribal chairmen here, and I think it's uh, it, it augurs for a very good process, Madam Chairman, as we move forward uh, with WERDA. Uh, it's just fantastic. And so, uh, gentlemen, I, I will have questions for you, but first I want to talk just a minute about a South Dakota tribe. Last week, I got a letter a very detailed letter from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in South Dakota, as well as uh, uh, North Dakota. And uh, Madam Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to enter that letter into the record. Your staff does have a copy of it. So ordered. Very good, thank you. Now in this letter, they talk about, uh, we've got the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed. It's got so much money. But despite that fact, they know that they didn't feel like the dollars were particularly well tailored toward Indian country. And, and that might well be because the process that the infrastructure package uh, came together underneath was uh, unusual, uh, particularly on the House side, maybe not as collaborative or as bipartisan as we would have liked. Uh, but but uh, I think we still have an opportunity uh, through the implementation to make sure that the interests of Indian country are uh, well taken care of. And I will note in this letter, they do specifically mention water priorities as something that that uh, will likely not be adequately addressed through that legislation alone. So, uh, and to that end, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Yukupicio, you recommended the Army Corps develop a plan for tribal engagement on environmental infrastructure. And then uh, Chairman Siki, you recommended that uh, the Corps for each of their districts have a tribal liaison. And so I just, I, I would want you each take one minute to kind of describe to the committee uh, some of the frustrations you might have had from a communication perspective in dealing with the federal government. Muskogee tribe. Uh, yes, we have had a, uh, you know, very very few dialogues and visits and here on the reservation. And as you know, you know, with climate change and the drought, the the Arizona drought, and all those problems that we are facing now in Arizona, it is critical. It's super critical to have the commitment of the Army Corps and everybody else here to look at the issues here with with our reservation here being as dry as it is. And we are depending on the city of Tucson and they're having all kinds of problems too with trying to provide water to the ever growing city. But for us, I think it's very critical in all the tribes that live in the dry desert like we do to have that relationship and that communication and an open door to be able to communicate with each other and they can really, really visit us and come here. And I think that's part of the issue is just initiating that dialogue and a true meaningful relationship with the Army Corps. Sir, I think that's very well said. And clearly, we'll do a better job as you know, One America at targeting those dollars if uh, we have a fuller, deeper, uh, and uh, more accurate understanding of your needs, right, sir? Absolutely. You know, uh, when you start looking at you know our allotment and our relationship with the city of Tucson, it's climbing and climbing, and the needs. Are keep getting bigger and bigger, you know, for the city and and for us, it just keeps shrinking and shrinking. So we must find alternative ways and waterways and resources on how to limit our usage, use more of of uh, the cap water district and uh, allotment and all that stuff. So we are working on all kinds of different ways to be able to provide water for now and in the future for us. It was in a congressional bill actually when we got recognized to have land and water as a priority. But to this day, we don't have anything like that yet set up. So I really thank you and I thank the committee for listening to us because when you start looking at the growth of this nation as the Pasco Eco tribe, then we are super limited here in this corridor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's get the uh, Chairman Siki in a little bit. Sir, what are your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Representative Johnson, for your question. We have great difficulty in navigating the various regulatory and reporting requirements that federal agencies place upon us in our efforts to improve our resources and infrastructure. It's not just the Army Corps problem. As an underserved community, we do not have the capacity to manage all federal hurdles placed on us. The pandemic and the federal response of burdensome grants, more regulations has only worsened things for us. Red Lake is a leader in Indian country, but we struggle on a daily basis to keep up 
to date, with new funding, opportunities, reporting requirements, and status of environmental permit application. The Army Corps' permitting process is burdensome, time-consuming, and the process gets stalled, leading to needless project delays. A tribal liaison in each region, one who is dedicated solely in working with tribes, could assist in resolving permitting issues, increase our accountability, but there also needs to be change at the national level to reduce regulatory and reporting burdens. And I hope my testimony today can raise awareness of this need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Stanton, followed by Mr. Cohen, and then Mr. Huffman. Mr. Stanton, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. My questions start with Chairman Ucapicio. Thank you again for sharing your tribe's experience as the first recipient in our state and the first tribal recipient of funds through Arizona's Environmental Infrastructure Authority. Chairman, how long has the tribe been working on this important water distribution line? You know, it's been about 20, 30 years, but if you really realistically look at, you know, once uh, we came to the reservation, these lands here, you know, the first struggle was how do we provide water? We then provided these big old tanks that looked like oil wells and fields like that. Little did we know that they were not capped on top and there was actually flying birds and stuff that were dead in there. And that was the drinking water provided at that time here. There was nothing around here in the desert. We then tapped into what the city water line was. And even then you start thinking about how, how much and how are we gonna grow someday if this is our reservation. And it's being provided by the city, but it's not enough. And when I start looking at, you know, once, this funding came and we thank you for it and thank you everybody that was responsible for it. I, I truly look forward to, you know, minimizing some of the drinking potable water from the city of Tucson and using our allotment to be, make sure that we can provide, you know, uh, good healthy ball fields for our elders, yeah. our youth and everybody else and our health divisions, you know, diabetes and everything else. And now COVID being like that, it's a hard thing to, to deal with right now when you start thinking of you know the water and getting water to them and their homes and everything else so for us it's it's a must and we thank you very very much for being the first tribe and making sure that we can we can alternate and use That's other great. resources thank yeah, you 20 30 years and now we're able to actually start construction on it is so important Absolutely. for the people of your community and for the entire state of Arizona your testimony highlights two key key issues that could pose barriers for other tribes to participate in the Environmental Infrastructure Authority. Cost share and the requirement that recipients pay for project costs up front before getting reimbursed by the Corps. My office has heard similar concerns from smaller and more rural communities. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of adding that flexibility to the Environmental Infrastructure Program to ensure that small, rural, and tribal communities with limited resources are not precluded from participating in this authority. Yes, and the funding is the issue, you know, not tribes. Tribes don't have the, the, the funding to be able to cover the 25% even more. Uh, there's hidden costs and everything else once you start doing the project. And I think the more and more when we look at a bigger part of the, the alternative funding sources, federal and everything else that can be used, that's what tribes really need. You know, they would have to take away, like us, things to educate, things for uh, some of our housing needs and all that stuff to use some of that funding and find federal funding. I think that's where the key is, giving us more funding to get these projects underway so we can conserve and conserve the water that's really, really sacred and needed here in the Southwest for all tribes. That's great. And I'm an urban Congress member, but I know that the success of our tribal communities are important for the entire state of Arizona. So that partnership is incredibly important. I have a question for Ms. Hill Great Gabriel. Uh, given the impacts of drought and wildfire to Western water supplies, including Army Corps facilities, what are the opportunities or barriers to the Corps utilizing natural infrastructure and nature-based solutions to address these water challenges? Thank you for the question, Congressman Stanton. I think it's excellent, first off, 
how much discussion is taking place and understanding how what the Corps can do more um, in addressing water scarcity issues in the West. I think we're already seeing progress on what have previously been barriers, which is really just interagency coordination, either at the federal level, but also incorporating state and local entities. But as progress on that front becomes more clear, it's going to be important to support efforts to ensure that the Corps has the necessary authorities to fully analyze the opportunities they have, like restoring wetlands upstream of water storage facilities and things of that nature and other natural infrastructure options. And we'd love to see you know, the advancement of pilot projects that can demonstrate some of these benefits of natural infrastructure in the West. Lieutenant General Spellman had testified back in January that you know there's additional research needs in this field. So I think it's something that's going to be really helpful for us all to dig into together. Thank you so much. My time is up. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Uh, uh, the order has been changed. Ms. Gonzalez Colon, then Mr. Cohen and Mr. Kaufman. Ms. Gonzalez Colon, you're recognized. Jennifer Gonzalez Colon. Gone? Okay, Mr. Cohen, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for calling this hearing. Uh, it, this is an uh, uh, important hearing, and uh, as we look forward to their next word of bill. In uh, our last word of bill, 2021, I was proud to sponsor provisions that were included to update the Army Corps' environmental justice priorities to promote meaningful involvement of minority and low-income communities in the formulation of future projects. Uh, we had a pipeline here in Memphis, a Bahalia pipeline that was proposed, an oil pipeline that had gone through predominantly minority communities, and it was a heroic effort that led to the, their decision to, to not go forth with the pipeline because it was went straight through the minor, minority communities, low-income, lesser, uh, uh, power, less powerful communities rather than others that were, could have gone. Uh, so that unjustly impacted several predominantly black neighborhoods. And that's a concern that I have and continue to have. The 45 mile pipeline would have cut through the historic Boxtown community, which got its name uh, after formerly enslaved people used scraps of material and wood from train boxes to build homes there in the late 19th century. People there are still in Boxtown and proud of Boxtown, this poor community. Uh, in addition to the company choosing the location because it was a point of hope, they said the point of least resistance, pretty, pretty audacious uh, upfront statement. They either overlooked or ignored the fact that the Southwest Memphis community is already burdened by other industrialized facilities and possess community cancer rates four times the national average. Uh, we've got a oil uh, plant down there and they spew out fumes and TVA did a lot of that too. Uh, the pipeline was killed due to historic grassroots effort, but uh, that's not always the case. It's alarming to see this uh, happen and the community get involved. To, to take advantage and, and to be successful. And we also had the help of Vice President Gore and others. Uh, because of this incident, I resolved to try to reform the nationwide permit uh, process that gave them that opportunity, uh, but also to work to ensure environmental justice issues are centered uh, properly. Ms. Ms. Hill, Gabrielle, uh, in 2020, the Board of Congress made some progress in directing the court to approve the agencies engagement and consultation with economically disadvantaged minority communities and tribal communities. However, didn't go far enough, I think. How can we build upon the progress of word of 2020 to improve how the core implements work with uh, environmental justice and tribal communities? Thank you, Congressman Cohen, and especially for your leadership and, and passion on these issues. Um, I agree that good progress was made in word of 2020 but that much more remains to be done to improve the course work with disadvantaged communities and tribes. It was great to hear Assistant Secretary Connor focus on the Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative and the emphasis on working and supporting and ensuring, you know, the we're analyzing the impacts of disadvantaged communities and underserved communities when he testified before this committee back in January. But I think that ensuring that systems and programs are in place to assist the communities with their water resources challenges who may not otherwise have the technical capacity to identify the project needs is another place that we can move forward. Um, in addition to making sure that the past provisions that were in Word of 2020 are actually being carried out. So I thank you again for, for your focus on this issue and hope we can, we can work together to keep 
making sure that this is a central focus of Order 2022. Well, thank you and your work at the Audubon Society and all y'all do. I'm pleased to, to work with you and work on these projects. And I'm going to continue to move forward. In Word of 2022, I have uh, some additions that I'd like to see considered increasing opportunities for assistance by expanding the 10 community pilot programs for economically disadvantaged communities to increase capacity and expertise within the Army Corps by establishing a new position of senior advisor for environmental justice within the office of the chief of engineers. They need that. They need somebody that will tell them about environmental justice, which right now they kind of gloss over or don't have a charge. We need to establish a federal advisory committee on environmental justice to better advise the Corps on these activities and actions that can be taken to assure more equitable delivery of services and projects. And we need to incorporate toxic re re remediation and ecological restoration, navigation, and flood resiliency projects. And so last but not least, we need to support minority-owned businesses by directing the Corps to increase collaboration, contracting, and subcontracting with minority-owned businesses to improve gender-based and race-based uh, outcomes. The Mississippi River, which provides drinking water to over 20 million Americans and its watershed covers 40% of the continental United States, is suffering from excesses, pollution, invasive species, wetlands loss, and destruction, and extreme storm of events exaggerated by climate change. While the Army Corps has the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Project, I believe Congress should take bold action and champion the transformation, sustainability, and resilience of the most important working river in the world. Uh, I think my time's expired, but uh, if anybody wants to just comment on that, Mississippi River Corridor is most important, and we need to have something similar to the Great Lakes Restoration uh, to protect it. Thank you, and uh, uh, forward to working with members of the committee and the, our panelists on these issues. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez Colon, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair, and all the witnesses, um, and Frankie member for holding this hearing, and to all the witnesses uh, for sharing uh, their experiences and needs uh, with us. In that sense, as I said during the last hearing, the Corps of Engineer Project has been critical resources I have counted on for Puerto Rico. And in the past few years, in the face of disasters, uh, unprecedented, unprecedented levels of funding um, were provided that enable us uh, to address uh, projects that has been pending for decades. Uh, but there's still great needs and not just in Puerto Rico, uh, the, whole, uh, uh, the rest of the nation. Uh, but just to give you an example of how important those water projects are, uh, just this weekend's rains of over 15 inches have caused widespread flooding across the island. Uh, this emphasize the need for regular programs to address these risks to be kept up to date, uh, be processed, processed proceed, uh, promptly, and not to have to need, uh, the need of a disaster supplemental just to get started. Uh, every time WARDA comes around, I support the, the increase of, to the project limits on sections 205, 208, and 14 continuous authorities program because as time passes, increasing cost of labor and materials makes projects our community need exceed the maximum uh, funding available. And that's one of the biggest problems that I assume is not just Puerto Rico, it's, it's the rest of the nation. Uh, just recently under the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, uh, the Corps of Engineers has announced uh, the go ahead of construction in the case of the island of the ecosystem restoration of Caño Martin Peña for environmental balance, uh, security of infrastructure, and justice for, justice for communities. Um, the San Juan Harbor navigation channels strategically essential to keep uh, open a major port of Puerto Rico as well. The flood control projects of Rio Culebrina, Sinaguada, and Aguadilla, and Rio Manatí and Ciales. Uh, we also uh, we have also seen recent attention on there's a study and investigation for uh, the extension by further three years of Puerto Rico coastal risk study uh, to consider more environmentally friendly protection measures. And uh, the flood control study in Yaucoa, very vulnerable, vulnerable community that is at the historic uh, landfall point for the hurricanes. For hurricanes. Uh, but again, there's still many pending major projects that have finished feasibility studies and chief reports from the Army Corps and with, uh, uh, with uh, authorizations and appropriations, uh, such as uh, the Guayanilla Flood Protection Project, a Protect 
to protect that entire town that has been impacted severely by multiple natural disasters. Uh, the San Juan Metro Bay uh, Coastal Protection Project that uh, will combine structural and non-structural measures to combat erosion and flooding around the area. Also, there's a need for attention and studies for such things as the authorization projects, uh, where conditions, requirements, and cost, cost has changed. Uh, and this is something that is happening with inflation and many other uh, issues. But in the case of Puerto Rico, there are changes on the cost uh, affected Rio Guanajibo, Nigua, Rio Grande de Lodiza, Adurao, and pending Section 205 studies like Rio Inabon, Mercedita en Ponce, Ibonito, Yauco, Villalba, just to mention a few. The federal assumption of maintenance of the Port of Tacoa, an important fuel terminal uh, that was originally privately owned, um, and many other across the island. So uh, hearing today many of the witnesses is just an example of all the important areas that need to be addressed. This is not the first hearing we got regarding water resources and water projects. And I hope we can work together as we did in the infrastructure package uh, to make it happen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam, Mr. Mr. Gonzalez Colon. Thank you for your comments. And now we turn to Mr. Huffman. You're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for this hearing. And uh, I would like to uh, begin with uh, Mr. Crowfoot. Uh, Mr. Crowfoot, uh, I want to follow up on the exchange that you had earlier with my colleague from the Sacramento Valley. Um, dredging, of course, is a priority for all of us in our districts, but how we do it really matters, especially in sensitive habitats. And too often over the years, I've heard people talk about the ESA and CESA as if they are just a nuisance standing in the way of doing things, usually the same kind of things that have wrecked the Delta ecosystem and driven species like the long fin and Delta smelt uh, to the brink of extinction, along with our iconic salmon and steelhead runs. So I know that in this case, the Army Corps' own findings show that their hydraulic dredging practices in these areas were having significant adverse impacts on the Delta smelt and the long fin smelt. That is why they were sued. And nobody has argued they should not dredge. Uh, this is simply a, a question of how they do it and whether they use the latest technology to reduce fish mortality. So I want to just um, see if you agree with me on that. I want to give you a chance to clarify that that previous exchange with my colleague did not reflect the unfortunately all too familiar antipathy we sometimes hear towards the uh, Endangered Species Act and CESA. Thanks so much, Congressman. Yes, let me let me emphasize that we need to manage our rivers uh, and, our, and our waterways, both for economic activity and uh, environmental quality. And we can and must do both. So I think we share the, the same goal, which is to enable appropriate dredging in a way that doesn't uh, damage or clearly make extinct uh, fish species. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, another thing we probably agree on is that there's plenty of dredge material to use for levees and for wetland restoration all over the Bay Area and in the Delta if we just do a better job on beneficial reuse. And uh, I know that the Petaluma River in my district is a great example. It was finally dredged a little over a year ago after uh, not being dredged since 2003. And the dredge spoils were used in a nearby park and wetland restoration. A lot of that could be used in other parts of the Petaluma Marsh and in all sorts of other opportunities. We've got to raise Highway 37, and there is going to be an enormous need uh, for beneficial reuse so that we can use natural solutions to provide um, all sorts of uh, priorities. So um, amazingly, in uh, the year 2022, the Army Corps still hauls huge volumes of this valuable um, material out to sea uh, and just dumps it in, in the ocean. Uh, would you agree that um, we could do uh, much better by the environment and by the natural solutions we need for sea level rise and flood protection and other priorities if we could find a way to beneficially reuse all of this material uh, and put it to work um, for those priorities? Absolutely. We clearly need to build our climate resilience uh, within the San Francisco Bay and our wetlands and on our rivers. And this 
dredge material is beneficial and important, in fact, very important. So from my perspective, we need to help the Corps update the approach that they use to actually utilize this material to build the resilience of both our natural systems and uh, protecting our community. Thank you. Uh, in the time I have left, I want to ask a question of Mr. Secchi. I was really pleased to hear your testimony about how the Red Lake Band of Chippewa uh, has worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, something that hasn't always happened uh, in years past, and that they appear to be engaging in good faith government to government consultations with your tribe. Um, we have an opportunity to do something like that in the northern part of my district. Uh, Redwood Creek is a really valuable estuary where we need to do a levee setback and some other restoration, and uh, certainly the local tribes in that area want to be partners. Uh, do you have any advice uh, for us as we you know, begin to try to forge the kind of partnership that you seem to have developed uh, in your region? Sorry, do I read this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question. But what, what we're doing is uh, with the activities proposal for 25,000 acres of marsh will be restored and waterfall and fur bears will return. Seasonal migration of many fish species will re be restored, including walleye and lake sturgeon. Our sturgeon were important to us for centuries, but they were lost after the dam was built. We are bringing the sturgeons back, but restoring the connection between the river and the lake is critical. We still practice a subsistence lifestyle at Red Lake. All of these species are important to us. Our reservation is blessed with natural resources, not by accident. It is the result of strong leadership, forethought of our ancestors, and strong conservation stewardship. This is what we're doing. Well, congratulations on your success there, uh, and I hope to learn more about it uh, and maybe replicate some of it in the northern part of my district. Madam Chair, thank you for this hearing, uh, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. And uh, that was the last of our, win of our questioners. In closing, I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. And I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and for information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered. I would also like to thank all our great witnesses, especially the tribal chairman for the testimony today. And I also thank our members for their participation. If no other members have anything to add, the committee stands adjourned.